Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on November 16th here at First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo, Texas. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we are here to do what we usually do on this day and that is read our daily lectionary texts and talk about it and maybe wrestle with it a little bit and struggle. I know uh, Natalie and I were talking prior to uh, starting today and we were both thinking how some weeks we can have a very engaging conversation and other weeks we kind of sit here in silence and ponder a little bit more and that's okay uh, because there are some texts that are worth pondering um, but we do believe that God is the one who will speak to us through his word and that we would be transformed by it and some of them just kind of have to sit on a little bit and that's okay. So, as uh, we get ready to read our text for today, let me open us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for always being with us. Thank you for giving us your word that we can read and think about and ponder. I pray, Lord, that our pondering today would bring you glory and would be useful for building up the community of faith. We thank you and we praise you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today, we're going to start with Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of their peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. And then Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those whose hope who hope in his steadfast love. Our prophetic word today is going to come from Malachi chapter 1. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. I have made his hill country a desolation and his heritage a desert for jackals. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild to the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down until they are called the wicked country, the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. A son honors his father and servants their master. If then I am a father, where is the honor due me? And if I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name? You say, how have we despised your name? 
by bringing polluted food on my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? By thinking that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not wrong? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not wrong? Try presenting that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now, implore the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. The fault is yours. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and the food for it may be despised. What a weariness this is, you say, and you sniff at me, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in the flock and vows to give it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is revered amongst the nations. And from the New Testament, we'll read James chapter 3, verse 13 through chapter 4, verse 12. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, uns unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder, and you covet you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture said, God yearns Jealousy for the spirit that he has made to dwell with dwell in us But he gives all the more grace Therefore it is said it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble Submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to God and he will draw near to you Cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? Our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, 
Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And back to the Psalms, we, we will read Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver, I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Well, those were some uh, longer passages today. I kept thinking, oh yeah, you're just, you know, you're reading James, and I thought you had that top paragraph, and I'm like, oh my gosh, she goes all the way through chapter 4, verse 12, and it just kept going and kept going, and that was good, good stuff, and I think it all did really fit well uh, together. Um, yeah, so uh, Malachi, let's go ahead and just start with Malachi. It sometimes yeah. seems easier to start at some of the Old Testament stuff. Right. But um, you know, Malachi, or as they like to say, you know, Malachi, the Italian prophet, but uh, he was the, the last prophet that spoke to the Hebrew people um, prior to them in the New Testament. Uh, Malachi is the last voice of God before essentially 400 years of silence, uh, at least in terms of scriptural text. And I think it's interesting how Malachi kind of starts off similar to other prophets, but um, with some difficult words, some tough words. Um, but even the first uh, little paragraph there talking about the difference between Esau and Jacob. And obviously Malachi is referring back to the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob being the, uh, the, the favored son of of. Of Rebecca and Esau being the favored son of Israel and how there was tension and conflict between the two. Jacob's name himself meaning uh, the supplanter, the one who grabs. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know the whole story. Jacob um, fools Isaac, puts on, you know, the skins of an animal, puts on his brother's clothes, comes in, his dad can't see very well, and does this whole deception thing and receives the blessing from Isaac. And then when Esau finds out about it, Esau is enraged, obviously, and wants to kill his brother, and that's where Jacob runs off, and then has his encounter with his uncle Laban, where he marries his cousin Rachel and his cousin Leah, and there's, anyway, the whole thing, the whole thing. If you want to read about it, go back to Genesis and reread all these stories, because these are important for us to understand really what Malachi is saying. Um, so it even starts off with this recognition of the ongoing tension between... 
uh, people who were in the same family but end up having different responses to God's grace where the people of Esau, uh, otherwise known as the Edomites, um, were in conflict against the Hebrew people and there was they, they, they shared a border with one another and there was constant tension between those two. Some days they'd be better off than others, you know, like any other family, you can have relative peace, but like with most families, there's going to be some sort of internal conflict. And so here's where God continues to do something different, where um, Esau was the older son, and historically the older son would have received those blessings, those primary blessings, but Jacob, the younger son, uh, supplanted him, grasped hold of those things, stole them away. But we see even here in the text where God says um, these really difficult, tough words where, you know, I loved Jacob and I have hated Esau. And we're just like, how is this? Right. What do you do with that? What do you do, do, you do with that? I thought, I thought um, you know, if God is love, right? All loving, right? Well, and he is. And so we see this, again, tension, even within families, how God seems to, um, well, it seems kind of apparent, you know, he loves one and hates the other. But what exactly does that mean? And I think this is where it's kind of getting teased out a little bit in Malachi, where here comes even the words against the Hebrew people. Now these are the people in Jerusalem. These are the descendants of Jacob. These are the ones who are offering sacrifices to God and... Which they were told to do. Which they so were told they to do. following the law in a right, sense. Right, right. But, right. but the you... whole pollution and the deception and the taking for granted maybe. Right. We're favored status. We're the favored sons. We're the descendants of Jacob. We're going to do it right because God loves us. Yeah, he hates Esau. Esau, those are the bad people. We are sons of Jacob. We're doing it right. So they do what? Well, you know, God wants perfect sacrifices, but we're going to bring in on the sly the lame, the blind. What we don't want. The stuff we don't want. Right. How, easy, how easy is it to give what we've deemed lesser? Right. But God demands. He demands our best. Right. The whole reason why it's a sacrifice is because it was worth something. Right. And here are the people that are bringing their worth less as a sacrifice. But really it's not. They're culling their own herd of the weak as opposed to bringing the strong uh, they're giving the, the, the afterthoughts, the less than. And I wonder, you know, how does this apply to us today? How many ways, even in church, do we think that, oh, I showed up. Isn't that good enough? Right. I, brought a, uh, I brought a gift and I put it in the plate. I, um, I sacrificed so much of my own precious time to, to be an hour at church or two hours or whatever you want to say. Right. But is it really our best. Right. It's easy to give out of abundance. To give the first fruits or to give the perfect. That's like you said, that is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, when you give something you want or you give something that would you know, make life easier for you. When you do mm. that, it does become a sacrifice. And so, yeah. Hmm. So I think that's, I think that frequently happens today. I think, I think God does require things of us. We do know that the full and complete and final sacrifice was made in Jesus Christ. Um, right. He, he is the one eternal sacrifice because it was the giving of himself, the perfect sinless self who gave himself. Uh, and being human um, was available, was, was then able to make a sacrifice on behalf of all of us being humans in a way that animal sacrifices or grain sacrifices or wine sacrifices or time sacrifices, whatever money sacrifices could never fully do. Right. So when we come today, it's not as if we come in a spirit of sacrifice. We come in a spirit of gratitude. We come in a spirit of appreciation for that which Christ has done. But I wonder if the same, uh, the same lesson applies. If we are truly grateful to God, 
would we not bring those things that are most important to us, trusting that he is the one that's going to provide. So again, it's not a sacrificial system, but it's a, but it's a gratitude system. Right. Right. Um, and so I think then when we jump over to James, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot, Natalie, you can jump You're anytime okay. you want. I but will. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm just making sure you know. But, uh, so you jump over into the James passage and you know, the beginning of, uh, if you've been doing your lectionary reading, you know previously in James, he gives that whole discourse on the tongue and how the tongue can be so hurtful and actually full of hellfire if it's used negatively against other people. Um, but James continues on with that, talking about how we are to um, uh, stay focused on those things which are good. Uh, not assuming that we know everything, uh, gaining and growing in wisdom, uh, being good uh, listeners to what God is trying to say. But even the uh, beginning there of chapter four, talking about the conflicts that occur, and I think this is where it's neat, uh, you, know, you jump back to the Malachi passage, there's conflicts that occur in families, you know, Esau and Jacob. Right. But then within the Christian community, James is talking about there's conflicts amongst you all because you've got the wrong mindset. Right. You're, yeah. No, you uh, keep talking. I, thought, no, I, thought, I, thought, I was I agreeing gonna, uh, with you, okay. but no, I'm, I'm thinking, but you keep talking. <laughs> right, okay, I'll keep, I'll keep talking. No, but um, like, the, you know, you, you don't have what you want because you didn't ask or because you didn't ask correctly, but I think that goes back to that same thing of, you know, do we do we look at it as sacrifice or as gratitude, right. and just the attitude in which mm -hmm. we approach God, and the the attitude and the posture in which we come to Him, and we are in relation with Him, and um, and so when we get those things mixed up, then when we come to to God, we're not bringing our best, and we're not. Um, you know, we're not we're not asking the right things, and, and I think sometimes it comes across as we're demanding things from God, right. rather than accepting and with thankfulness and with joy and with gratitude. You know, we get them mixed up. I think right. sometimes. Do we truly believe that God has given us everything that we need? Right. Um, and so, even with this idea of the conflict that occurs between the people. Um, God created communities of faith that we would be able to care for one another. We right. do know that in every community, there are going to be people that have um, more than resources. Resources, they have resources, others, and we know that the gifts are not distributed exactly one hundred percent equally. Everybody right. has a different gift within the community, but. Um, we as humans tend to uh, give greater glory for things that make ourselves look good. We give greater glory to uh, those that are um, culturally and societally more acceptable, more praiseworthy. And, and, I, and again, I think this is what James is talking about. There's, there's wisdom that's born out of, and I mean, the opposite of wisdom, born out of the envy and the boasting and all of that stuff and how, how destructive that is of community. When people put themselves forward as the one who controls everything as opposed to seeing their abundance as a gift from God for the benefit of everybody and still vice versa. Those who are in need are, are instead of asking appropriately are, are bitter and uh, envious and desiring of those things again which destroys community it's this is not a rich people are always bad and poor people are always righteous this is this shows the complexity of any community there's going to be tension and how should we address that tension and I think that's what a lot of what James is talking about right and when you talk about in community I think sometimes what happens is you know you don't want to get into that the rich or bad the poor this whatever um, but when you have people in community that it becomes a power issue, regardless of where the resource distribution is, that doesn't matter. When it becomes a power issue, um, in order to maintain that power, I think, and that pride, I'm kind of putting those in the same, you know, and, and here it speaks out, you know, God opposes the proud. And I right. think when we, when we assign that power, um, are we 
somehow think that we are powerful because of whatever status or whatever situation we're in um, and we allow ourselves to become prideful and boastful in order to maintain that level of power someone else has to be you have to have power over someone mm -hmm. in order to uh, by the standards of the world you have to right. have power over someone right. to be considered powerful well and in doing that it becomes the pride and the boastfulness rather than the humility and the humble heart and the servant heart in how can I live in community with people and bring people alongside or help people or whatever that may be but that that humble heart that servant heart versus that prideful heart that powerful heart that I've mm -hmm. got to put myself above others in order to maintain that status or that you know that level um, I, t I totally get that and I appreciate that uh, what is that verse 6 of chapter 4 but he gives all the more grace Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then drop down to verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Um, and, and if one were even to jump back to looking at Malachi and Esau and Jacob, that's where a lot of uh, Jacob's time of exile was okay. learning to be humble. Like God had chosen and loved Jacob for an, a, a specific purpose and a goal in mind, but it was that that proud heart that needed to be humbled mm -hmm. um, even though there yeah there's there's going to be the conflict and the tension but how much better would it be uh, for us to learn the examples from scripture you know what does God want us to do having a humble heart and that and again that works in both directions there are people who are uh, very uh, they, they have great material and spiritual and and gifted blessings and freely give and right. you wouldn't hardly know it because they're not trying to attract attention to themselves right. they are participating in community in a humble fashion mm -hmm. uh, and then there are people who are you know give generous amounts but have a different perception about it and right. uh, that that humbleness that's 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 the tension and i think we all fall into right. that we all want to toot our own horns right we all want our names to be right. praised amongst the people right acknowledgement feels good right acknowledgement, right acknowledgement you know affirmation you know i think sometimes i don't think that 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 is bad in and of right. itself to receive affirmation to receive that um but if that but was the goal, if that was the goal, then you've got your reward. <laughs> That's it. Right. But, but I think, um, right. We don't. I think when we do good things, I think when we live in community and we treat people well, we do that for the betterment of the community, yeah. not for acknowledgement. Right. I think it's the wrong intent. And, and I think that's. I think that's exactly right. The, the motivations of the heart and this is where again James is talking about do you really have wisdom based on the word or are you um, just not, not doing it right uh, and, and again James is writing to a community of faith and so uh, if there is conflict or tension within your own Christian community well hey you're human uh, every church is composed of humans did you expect it to be perfect did you expect everything to be easy even within your own congregation in your own community uh, we certainly have our tensions and problems here at first presbyterian whether you have them in your own place of worship or not um, how do we grow in that and recognize that and that attitude of gratitude i think fits perfectly into the the luke passage where mm -hmm. jesus does heal those 10 lepers um, I, I find it really fascinating that uh, preceding in, in Luke 15, where Jesus tells the parable of the, uh, the ten coins where one is lost, and there's more rejoicing over that one coin that was found than over the nine that weren't lost, just so in heaven, all these things. And now here are ten lepers where one returns after being healed. The ten did get physically healed from their leprosy. Jesus has the power uh, and the authority and the desire to bring healing to these people who cry out in mercy to Jesus. But that one person who returns, 
um, and gives thanks to Jesus. It turns out to be a Samaritan person where uh, you know, the enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans was widely known, but here is Jesus commending the, the attitude of, of thankfulness, of, of gratitude, um, and then uh, declares a, an additional healing on him in a way. Get up and go in your way. Your faith has made you well. Um, which does, again, seem a little bit different because all ten were healed. Right. But one was made well, and and that's that's a little tension in there because they were all healed, right? But only one made well. What does what does Jesus mean by that? How can we be made well? You might look really good on the outside, which is you know leprosy being cleansed from that. You look right. good on the outside again, but are you really good in the heart, as James would say? Do you really have true wisdom? Um, are you uh, expressing the gratitude to God who is the giver of all good gifts uh, so that when you bring your gratitude, it is those things that are most valuable to you. Uh, we bring our very selves. We have to lay our pride down. We have to lay our own presumptions down uh, before God to allow us then to lift us up. As Jesus says, get up, go in your way. Jesus has lifted up the humble his faith has made him well. Right. That one is always, I don't know, the, the ten lepers always, um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't undo the healing of the other nine. Right. Even though they didn't come back, he doesn't undo that healing and they were, like you said, their health. They they have their health and, and it was. They he, he did that and he doesn't undo that but it's this additional, hmm. it's this additional gift that is given to this man who returned. And um, I think that can go back to that James passage, you know, that very last verse where it said, um, humble yourselves and he will exalt you. You know, it's, it's, I mean, that's it right there. That's, he did, that's what he did. He, he elevated him, like you said, he gave him the additional that additional blessing. So, a lot of good stuff. I know that uh, typically on midweek connections we have four psalms, and there is a lot of repetition between these. At one point, we're going to have to memorize all of one forty-seven, one through eleven, right? I know. I don't. I don't know why. why I don't have it memorized yet. I know. I've loved like the last line, and I'm like, oh wait, no, get it back on. Get on board. Get, get on board. It back together. Uh, but I know we've read Psalm sixty-five, and I know we've done one twenty-five, and I know we've done ninety-one. Absolutely. Uh, and and I certainly hope that. Uh, that we all continue in the daily lectionary and get uh, extended uh, exposure to the Psalms. I was talking with somebody not too long ago where they said, um, you know, the Psalms have become my favorite really because of the uh, full expression of human emotions mm -hmm. and how um, each one will speak to us in a different way at a different time. And sometimes, you know, having four per day uh, sometimes, you know, you, you read them and then you go, yeah, that's good. And other times, like, one will really stand out to you. Or sometimes they will all stand out, depending on where you might happen to be at that particular day. Um, to me, they always feel, they not that, I don't know, they sometimes, you know, talking about the full gamut of emotion, the full range of emotion that you see in the Psalms. But the Psalms, to me, are just the most uh, raw. Mm -hmm. In real sometimes and so um, and then also sometimes it you know when you are experiencing if you read one that's a tough one and sometimes you go okay I'm not the only one that's ever felt that <laughs> and sometimes and, misery loves company <laughs> right, <laughs> right but yet then too comfort in knowing that right. when we do cry out or when we do have those emotions God is God is still our refuge mm -hmm. he is still there in that steadfast love offered to us and you know I think I think that's pretty at 65 my mind wandered a little while you were reading sorry that's all right. but I know everything today was pretty uh, it's, it's pretty uplifting uh, you know 147 always is right. 125 and then of course the, the Psalm 91 mm -hmm. the promises of Psalm 91 are our comfort there. 
but sometimes when they are psalms that are so difficult sometimes or the psalmist is seems almost angry with God sometimes you're like wow mm-hmm. and that's okay I mean yeah. God's big enough that he he knows that he created us he knows we have those emotions right. and he's in that he is there in those moments as well I and, agree. So. well good you have anything else no I I'm good. How about you? I'm, I'm feeling. I'm feeling great. I, you know, just for the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. It's just like there's this weird sort of God even protects us from doing wrong. Yeah, you know, it's just That's like right. even, even like wow, well, yeah, God, God in His love and His mercy, somehow like yeah, it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> Step away from the edge. Step away, right? It's like <laughs> don't, don't do, don't do wrong. We're gonna we're gonna make sure you do right, and so, yeah, attitude of gratitude in all ways. Attitude of gratitude. All right. Why don't you go ahead and close us in prayer? All right. Gracious Lord, thank you, thank you for um, words of comfort and uplifting words today in your psalms, and thank you for the promise of of love and forgiveness and. Um, for the blessings that you do give to us. And I just pray that as we come to you, that we do come with humble hearts and with open hearts, um, that we hear what you're trying to say to us and that we submit to your will and that we, um, we can love you well we can love you well and that we can offer ourselves to you in a way fitting to you. And in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us again today and look forward to the next time together. Have a good day. Bye-bye.